Hello and welcome to another chess video. I am Vita Master in Kalia Wenzel from Iceland and we are going to look at another game by Vladimir Kramnik in this video. So we've looked at a few games by Kramnik already following his uh, uh, retirement from professional chess and yeah I do have a playlist now with Kramnik's games and we're slowly going to build that up. We're going to link to it in a card and probably at the end screen as well so if you want to look at more great games by this uh, fantastic champion, the 14th world champion, then do check that out. This game was played in 1992 when uh, Vladimir Kramnik was 17 years old and this was the year where he kind of burst onto the scene like uh, in a very violent fashion uh, so to say. This was the year that he played at the 1992 Manila Olympiad. We'll have a look at games from that tournament and there he uh, had this fantastic score of eight and a half out of nine and really burst into the limelight and yeah there was no stopping him from there uh, he became a star and later of course world champion but yeah this was uh, in the european championship in 1992 in Debrecen, which is in hungary and vlad's opponent in this game is simbad neputian from armenia and yeah, he has won the uh, Olympic gold with Armenia, so no stranger to international competition. And 1992, probably uh, around and close to the height of his own chess career. And here we have Radovir uh, with the white pieces. And as always, uh, around these years, d4. Kramnik was one of the reasons uh, I myself started to play d4. We have e6 by Leputian. And We've seen this before. This is, of course, an invitation to uh, the French e4, and Leputian does indeed play the French as many Armenians uh, did at that time. And there's, a, there's even a, a variation in Venever called the Armenian variation, which Leputian and the other Armenian players championed around this time. That's uh, well, that's a different story. In this game, after knight f3, we have d5, uh, the queen's gambit. Queen's gambit declined, knight c3. Bishop e7, and Kramnik goes for bishop f4. Of course, bishop g4 is more common, but bishop f4 is a very, very popular line as well. Leputian castled e3, and here uh, c6. c5 is also played, knight bd7. I played this move myself, and this featured in the uh, Carlsen against. Uh, Anand World Championship match, Anand had white against Carlsen in, in this line, but Leputian goes c6, a more, perhaps more passive, uh, but also a more solid line. And note that white hasn't taken on d5, so uh, black hasn't gone, he takes d5, so there's no easy way for this bishop to uh, to get out to either f5 or g4, which it will usually try to do in a queen's gap, but declined. So white gets on with development, queen c2. And we will have this um, interesting battle now. After knight bd7, white plays h3. And what we will have now, uh, we've seen before, and I'm reminded of a recent game uh, by Rajapov from Tata Steel, which we had to look at here. And it's the battle of um, tempos in a way. White wants to develop this bishop, but he doesn't want to do it until he can take on c4 in one move. He doesn't want to, instead of h3, to play a move like bishop d3 and have to spend basically two moves taken on c4. Black will then go for his usual card to play with b5 and he has essentially gained the tempo. So we have this kind of tempo dance or waiting move dance here with h3 and we saw the uh, exactly the same thing in this game between Radzibov and uh, Vidit and I encourage you to uh, have a look at that video as well. If you want to learn more about chess, you have to learn about these typical patterns that come up again and again. And this is a typical pattern that you must know in d4 openings. So h3, and black continues waiting as well. He plays a6, he doesn't take on c4. And white continues as well. He doesn't move the bishop, he plays rook to d1. And the rook, the rook can quite often become useful on uh, d1. If the game uh, goes in a normal direction, either with black taken on c4, or maybe in, in extreme cases, white bringing with e4, the rook will become important on the d-file once you start to push the d-pawn. 
Um, so this is a useful move for white. white. So white is trying to find useful moves before he moves the bishop. Black continues and tries to do the same, but he plays h6. And while this is often useful, this is also a weakening move. And once you play h6, it's much harder for you to play g6. And we, we will actually see this being important later in the game. So this essentially does weaken this diagonal here. It becomes more vulnerable. Kramnik finds another waiting move. He plays a3. And here finally black cracks and take uh, takes on c4. Could have played rook e8 and kept on waiting, but he felt enough was enough, and now he took on c4. Okay, Kramnik takes on c4 in one move. Uh, mission accomplished. And white has a very harmonious development. His bishops are out to nice squares. The knight, knights are out. Only remains to castle, and we have classical development with all the pieces out. Central control and the rooks connected. So black plays, tries to sort of uh, prevent that with knight d5. And his idea is that, yeah, he wants to gain more foothold in the center. And at the moment, he's attacking this bishop, which would double white's pawns. And indeed, a move like bishop h2 would be very reasonable. And white probably keeps a classical slight edge here uh, with his space advantage. But Kramnik preferred to castle, so he wants all, all his moves to have purpose. And yeah, this is another reason why I find this game interesting. Uh, I've never played this idea myself, and black took on f4 here. So white allows his pawns to become doubled, and he gives up the bishop pair and the strong black squared bishop. In return, however, he will get a very nice outpost for the knight on uh, the e5 square. And it will be yeah, firmly supported by uh, the pawns on d4 and e5. Uh, sorry, on, on f4 and d4. So, yeah, it's it's a, a pros and cons game. I've seen uh, Gelfand play this idea um, in the past, and Akiba Rubinstein was also a great master of this idea. So something to keep in mind. Um, it's something I've been looking to master, and certainly this game will help in, uh, in that regard. Uh, black played queen c7 here. Not sure it's entirely useful. Uh, you, yes, you do attack this pawn, but knight e5 was going to be played anyway, and that's what uh, white did. Knight to e5, and yeah, now knight to f6. And we sort of see all the moves by white in this game having like a great purpose. So, I mean, he finished normal classical development, placed the, nice, uh, the knight on a nice outpost here, protected by these nice pawns that are giving white some control of, of key squares and giving him space advantage. And now he goes about sort of taking advantage of what we talked about earlier, the weakening of this diagonal. But how can he do that? Yes, you can do that by uh, rerouting the bishop. And that's what he did. He played bishop a2. He simply wants to put this bishop on b1. The bishop will line up with the queen and we have a dangerous battery here. We only have to remove a knight, and then we're threatening checkmate. Lepurion, of course, recognizes that idea and plays bishop b7. And his idea after bishop b1 is to play bishop to e8. And he does that so he can play g6 if and when needed. And probably if it was his move, he would play g6. And what cannot take on g6 now because of the bishop on e8. So passive but nice defensive idea. And another idea is after knight to g4, which looks tempting, trying to dislodge this knight, which is preventing mate. After the force g6, knight takes black and play king g7. And actually now the queen becomes useful because once the knight moves and we chop it off, we can take on f4. And with the position opening up for the bishops, all of a sudden black is better now. So we can't allow the position to open up for the bishops. But here, Kramnik has a fantastic blow. I encourage you to have a look at this position and try to find what, what uh, Kramnik did here. Fantastic move. So, okay, assuming you sold it, and very well done indeed if you did. But if you just want to uh, see what happened, uh, here it comes b5. Sort of 
sort of a th thematic break in many uh, many D, uh, D4 openings. And you put the pawn on a square that is severely protected, but in turn, it either opens lines or has tactical consequences. In this case, uh, the tactical consequences are just uh, too much for black. So you can't actually take on d5. In the game, rook d8 was played, but let's have a look at what happens. So you have three choices. You can take with a knight. That's the easy one. You get made in one, so you can't do that. Okay, what about the pawns? c takes d5. Uh, here I play the excellent knight takes d5, exposing your queen. And if you trade queens, I have knight takes e7 with jack. Note that the king can't go to f8, so it has to move, and now I take on c2. We, we can continue with this line and play like bishop b5, attack the rook, and it looks like uh, our knight is trapped, but we can go to g6 and collect the rook for two pieces and the pawn, which means we'll be up the exchange and the pawn. The completely winning position. Last choice is to take with the uh, e-pawn. But then we have this pin uh, by our queen on our opponent's queen. Uh, the queen has a hard time protecting the bishop, and what's worse, uh, if the queen moves, whether it guards the bishop or not, we take on f6. And again, the knight is the only thing defending mate, so this mates in two. So instead, we saw rook to d8. And this move had to be made, because if... Uh, well, if you do nothing, which is uh, like this, I think. Let's just make a blank move, something like a5. Uh, so if black does nothing, we will play d6. Uh, fork on the queen and the bishop. Bishop takes knight g4, undermining the knight, protecting the mate. The only way to protect mate is g6, and you lose a piece for nothing. So rook d8 was to prevent d6. So d5, a very powerful move. Okay, rook d8. And here is sort of, yeah, this is a, a very nice moment in the game. And in the game, uh, in the book, uh, Crown Make My Life in Games, they call this um, sort of a middle game soup shrine for black. And they talk about that Kramnik thought after he made his move here, rook f to e1, um, he thought, okay, my, I'll just play this move, you know, quiet move, and my opponent is basically uh, in Sukhran. I mean, can't really do anything. And turns out black played king h8, and it's actually the best move according to the computer. Um, to see what we mean, um, you can't move the bishop. We've been over that. Now we play knight here, and we want to mind the knight. You can you have to prevent the, the mate, and you lose material. So you can't move the bishop. If you move the other bishop, then again, d6, you have to move the knight, and move the bishop, and then move my knight, and the same pattern. Um, the queen, what, what you can do with the queen? Well, you can't go off this diagonal, because yet again, we play d6. Rook takes, rook takes, bishop takes, knight g4. We win a piece. So it's very hard to move anything here. Of course, you can't move the knight. It's made in one. And the pawn moves are fairly useless. Uh, rook d8 actually didn't stop. Uh, we still have, after c d5, we have this. And take on e7. Uh, knight takes d5 is still made in one. And e takes d5, we still take here. The only difference is, you, okay, you can take with the rook, but this loses the exchange. Pawn is pinned to the queen. And this still can't move. So, it's almost just a magical position, and uh, yeah. Rook at e1, and move 18, and a 70-year-old is playing against uh, an experienced Armenian, Soviet Armenian grandmaster, and he's basically telling him, you know, make a move. <laughs> you you basically can't. This is, yeah, very nice. And king h8. But the problem with king h8 is that now this threat on h7 is even stronger, and even now when you move the pieces here that are clocked up and yeah preventing the king to to escape now there's no more escape uh, once the king is on h8 anyway so 
Kramnik now switches to uh, focusing on this diagonal and delivering mate. He takes on e6, rook takes d1 and rook takes d1. Okay, you have to take on e6 not to be down material. And again, you want to uh, get rid of this guy. We still have this wonderful battery, so knight to e4. Simply threatening to take and give mate here. So g6 closes the diagonal. Um, you can take on f6, it's a, it's a strong move, but uh, Kramnik went with knight to c5. Eyeing another weakness on e6, and also we have a lot of pieces uh, lined up against this weakness here. Still all these pieces. Leputian took on uh, c5, we have takes. Rook g8, protecting g6. But now uh, the bishop, bishop uh, switches, diagonals again, goes to a2. Eyeing this pawn now. And black gives it up. He doesn't really have a choice. He played king g7. But okay, let's say you try to block the diagonal. I take, and remember, we still have a pin on this pawn. White wins a pawn and has an absolutely overwhelming position. Total control and a weak king for black to boot, so completely winning. And bishop f7 allows the very nice move, queen d6. Which would work even without the rook on d1, because if takes, we win a piece. Very nice. And you're having problems uh, defending the queen and the bishop. If you play rook here, you take on f7. Queen takes and bishop e6, hitting the queen and the rook. Game over. So Lobutian just gives up the pawn, but not much remains. The rook is attacked, goes to f8. And now a very nice final blow by Kramnik. He plays knight to d7 and Leputian resigned he'd like to take on d7 but uh, after knight takes d7 rook takes d7 check bishop takes there's queen e7 and his mates in uh, two more moves queen takes f8 and queen g8 same thing for rook f7 interposing we take it and mate on g8 and if you try to give up the queen I will take it and then give this nice check on d4 which will win the bishop and a rook for a queen is not enough here so a very nice game by Kramnik only 17 years old and yeah a model d4 game and also a model game with uh, this pawn structure double pawns on the f-files strong knight on e5 and notice how every move was like strong powerful and with purpose and black like how do you get into a sukshuan and move 18 such a strong player it takes a special talent to make you look this bad, and Vladimir Kramnik truly was. So I hope you enjoyed this game. Um, I will keep on uh, posting games by, by Kramnik. Uh, plenty of games to choose from. And of course, we will have other material on the channel as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.